We are thankful to be able to resume physical service this November. So do reserve your seats if you wish to attend Sunday service in church. Now this morning, our dear brother Cheong Wai Chun will be sharing God's message with us. He has been involved in God's work in difficult places and now he continues to shepherd others who are working in the field. May we be encouraged by the sharing of God's word. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today, the church reopens for physical meetings after many months of lockdown. Lockdown not because of persecution, but because of COVID-19. But in fact, today, throughout the world, many churches are in lockdown because of persecution. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And according to the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, globally more than 300 million Christians live in places where they face persecution. This week, the church worldwide will remember our brothers and sisters who are suffering for their faith in Jesus. It is appropriate that last Sunday and today, SSGC's focus is on the theme of persecution. And this morning, I will be speaking on the response and outcome of persecution. And my text is from Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 40. And I'll read through the text in the NIV version. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they had heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Paul and Silas were arrested beaten and imprisoned. 
a mob was instigated by the owners of a slave girl who were furious that their income had been lost due to Paul casting out a spirit of divination from her. The mob took matters into their own hands and the magistrate completely ignored legal procedures, meeting out punishment without a trial. Now, Paul and Silas are confined in the prison cell. Their feet are bound by wooden stocks. Their wrists are chained to fetters on the wall. Their bodies beaten blue and black earlier in the day. How did they respond to persecution? How do we respond if we are persecuted? What are the possible responses to persecution? I shall list a few of the possible responses. The first possible response is to avoid persecution. Paul and Silas could have avoided persecution by stating that they were Roman citizens right from the outset. Note how powerful the status of Roman citizen, the status of Roman citizenship is. It changed the posture of the authorities towards them. When they, that means the magistrates, heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them or apologize to them in some versions and escorted them from the prison and requested them to leave the city. Not ordering them to leave the city, not deporting them, but requesting them to leave the city. But for some reason, on this occasion, Paul did not avoid persecution. Nevertheless, there are occasions when God directs his people to avoid persecution. For example, God instructed Elijah to hide in the wilderness after his prediction of drought as a judgment of God upon Israel and knowing that King Ahab would persecute Elijah. And Paul, after his conversion in Damascus, he escaped persecution and also avoided martyrdom, possible martyrdom, when he was lowered in a basket from the city wall. And the early church, after Stephen's martyrdom, the scattering of the Christians in response to persecution was used by God to spread and grow the early church. So at times, the church is meant to take certain actions to avoid persecution, and it must be God who initiates such a response. A local missionary I know in the Middle East had to flee his home country when authorities began arresting both the foreign and local missionaries and were looking for him. He found his way to a neighboring country and soon started training people in evangelism and church planting. For several years, he trained and sent people to reach out in that country and also sent people back to his own home country to reach out. His work bore fruit. And now, he is based in a free country, serving as one of the key leaders of an organization that ministers throughout the Middle East. I knew him when he was still a student in the university, and I could not have foreseen the route that God has taken him out of the clutches of the persecutors into being a strong influence and a blessing to mission work throughout 
the Middle East. The second possible response to persecution is to endure persecution. It is recorded in verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. People who have been unjustly accused, beaten and imprisoned, are unlikely to be found singing and praying. How is it that they are not mourning and shouting for justice? Several weeks earlier, God had given them a vision to bring the gospel to the people of Macedonia. And in a very short time, they had already seen a woman named Lydia come to the Lord and also seen a spirit cast out of a slave girl. God was on the move in Macedonia. The gospel was spreading. And for Paul and Silas, the mission make, to make Christ known is what matters most. More than their entitlement to justice. Seeing people set free is what matters to them. Christians are often called to persevere boldly in the midst of persecution. But there are times when God calls Christians to face persecution willingly. In Revelations, the church of Smyrna was warned that they were to endure persecution. Jesus instructs them, be faithful even to the point of death. Under God's direction and with His strength, Christians are to endure persecution for God's greater purposes. We can only do so under the power of the Holy Spirit and knowing that such experiences can be expected. Several years ago, due to persecution from the authorities, a missionary couple from a Southeast Asian country was directed to leave their country for a year until the situation was more conducive for their return. Initially, they were reluctant to leave, but later heeded the advice of church and mission leaders. New mission work was started by them in another country, and it continues to flourish to this day. A few years later, they returned to their country and after a while, faced severe persecution again. There was no doubt that they were prepared and willing to endure persecution for God's purposes. And their suffering continues to this day. The third possible outcome, the third possible response to persecution is to resist persecution. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are, real, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. It would appear that the magistrates in Philippi realized later that it might be best to send Paul and Silas on their way instead of moving ahead with a trial. So the magistrates sent their officers to the jail to release the prisoners. If Paul and Silas have quietly slipped out of town, it will be as though there was, an, there was an admission of guilt. Even worse, 
the magistrates will then feel empowered to unjustly arrest the Christians in Philippi. So Paul resists for the, and for the first time reveals to the officials that he and Silas are Roman citizens. Paul demonstrates resistance through his appeal to Roman law. He questions the legality of publicly beating and imprisoning him, a Roman citizen, and when he has not yet been convicted of a crime. He defended his, his legal rights in order to further the kingdom of God. There are times when God will lead his people to resist efforts to persecute his people. There are times when it is appropriate to fight for one's legal rights to resist persecution. My greatest respect goes out to a pastor who bravely stuck his neck out for a group of Christians who were accused of wrongdoing, who were accused by the authorities of wrongdoing. And in doing so, the pastor was also putting his church at risk. The pastor played a crucial role in defending the rights of the Christians. I was so inspired by the pastor's resistance to unjust actions and allegations. No doubt, his making a stand prevented both persecution and prosecution of the Christians. Fourthly, how do we respond to persecution? We are to show solidar solidarity with the persecuted. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Though it is not stated, I am, I am sure that the church, the newly planted church at Lydia's house, was showing solidarity with Paul and Silas during their imprisonment. I'm sure they were earnestly praying for them in their persecution. The Philippian church, in fact, developed a strong and loving relationship with Paul over the years. And this is evident from his letter written to them from his imprisonment in Rome a decade later. When they heard about his suffering in prison in Rome, they were worried about him. They showed their solidar solidarity by sending a gift to meet Paul's needs. The Philippines were not so wealthy. In fact, were not wealthy. So this gift was a significant sacrifice on their part. But they sent it eagerly because they were so concerned about Paul's well-being. They also sent a church member, Epaphroditus, to deliver the gift to Paul and to care for him in prison. And he also delivered a letter to Paul expressing the Philippians' fear that Paul was being persecuted by other believers and that a threat of death hung over his head. Out of deep concern for the apostle, the Philippians devoted themselves to prayer on his behalf. And in his letter to them, Paul confirmed that the Philippians had understood his circumstances and expressed appreciation for their concern, their gift, and their prayers. This caring relationship between Paul and the Philippian church illustrates the importance of showing solidarity 
with others through prayers, through gifts, through letters, through visits, so that they might persevere in the midst of persecution. Christians as members of one body must join in solidarity with those persecuted and share in their lives. A few years ago, my wife and I were asked to support a family who have fled their country to avoid persecution and threats of death from their own family members. We spent time with them for about a year before their departure to another country. They had to relocate every month and we visited them in a different home each time. We would bring them the food they crave from their home country. We had many memorable, memorable moments of enjoying food together, having fun with their children, and praying together. The most amazing experience was listening to the children, reciting portions of scriptures in their native language, and also in English, which was a new language for them. Their mother ensured that they were well-versed in scriptures at a young age. We also shared in her joy and pain, her fears and anxiety, as she waited patiently to be granted religious asylum in a safe country. There were also moments of despair when she worried about her children's future if the worst should happen to her. When they were finally granted asylum, we were sad to say goodbye, but at the same time, relief that they could rebuild their lives again and practice their faith freely in a free country. Looking back, we were glad for the opportunity or we were, we, we were glad we took the opportunity to express solidarity with them in their persecution. As initially, we were hesitant about getting involved. So those are four possible responses to persecution. What's the outcome of persecution? What's the outcome of Paul and Silas' persecution? Their imprisonment presented them the opportunity to share the gospel with the Macedonian jailer and his household. And here is what Paul reports as the outcome, beginning with verse 33. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The outcome of Paul and Silas' imprisonment will change lives and change relationships. Those who were once at enmity will immediately transform into the dearest of friends. An unbelieving household, an entire household, came to faith in Jesus because of Paul and, Simon, Paul and Silas' imprisonment. The longer-term outcome of their, in, of their persecution, I see, would be the continuance of the Philippian church, the church they started and left behind. I believe their persecution had a huge influence on the growth and maturity 
of the church. It grew quickly amidst persecution. It was also facing persecution a decade later when Paul wrote to remind them of his own persecution, which they personally witnessed in Philippi. It was a poor church, but it was caring and generous. It was a missionary supporting church. It was probably Paul's favorite church, as he wrote with much affection and referred to it as his joy and crown. But persecution can also result in a negative outcome. In some cases, persecution can destroy the church in a certain location. In many parts of the world, Christian communities are rapidly vanishing under relentless persecution. In North Korea, in the early 1900s, the church was thriving. Pyongyang, known as the Jerusalem of the East, had 2,000 churches. Today, the church is nearly absent. In Japan, the church was almost wiped out in the 1600s due to severe persecution and the execution of many Christians. If you watch the movie Silence, you will see how much trials and suffering the Christians in Japan went through at that time to stand up for Jesus. At the same time, where there's persecution, there's also revival. There are places in the world where persecution has caused the church to experience revival, such as, it, such as in Iran. According to Christian Broadcast Network, CBN, Christianity is growing faster in Iran than anywhere else in the world. Persecution also brings revival. So sometimes churches grow and Christians flourish under persecution, but sometimes they struggle. They are burdened by suffering or they perish. Whatever the outcome of persecution, whether positive or negative, our response is to seek God's direction as to the appropriate response on each occasion when we face persecution. In conclusion, let me just say a little about the, about the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian and pastor. Bonhoeffer is a good example of responding to persecution. He resisted an oppressive and persecuting regime through writing and public speeches. He avoided certain persecution through trips abroad and also teaching in his underground seminaries. At the same time, he endured the persecution of threats, intimidation, restrictions, imprisonment. And he also joined in the experience of many other Germans opposed to the Nazis' control over the churches. There were times when all four responses to persecution were at work in Bonhoeffer's life. He was ever faithful to Jesus, even to the point of death in the Nazi prison. When we are suffering and feeling confined, 
when we feel we have been treated unjustly, when we feel helpless, when we are in despair, we can't do anything. Let's remember Paul and Silas in that prison, in that cold, dark prison cell with their feet in the stocks, with their wrists chained to fetters in the wall. When they were thrown into prison, the inmates became their mission field and so were the jailers. Remember that no matter where we are, no matter how bad things are or things might seem, God is sovereign and He is quite capable of accomplishing His purposes in our situation. Let us now spend a few moments to reflect and to remember those who are suffering. Maybe people you know who are under persecution. Let us remember them and let us pray for them even now. Lord, we pray that you would make us ever mindful of our brothers and sisters around the world who need us to stand with them as they suffer in your name. Cause those that are inflicting such pain to be brought to repentance. May they turn from their ungodly ways to discover forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus. We lift up to you those who are experiencing discrimination and isolation because of their love for you. We pray for those living in places with strict religious restrictions and are longing to be able to worship you freely. We seek your strength for those weary with suffering. We ask courage for all who stand in danger due to their faith. O oh God, as we cry out on their behalf, we stand with them in their suffering. We remember their pain. May they know they are not forgotten. We hold them now before you. Work through the life of each one, that through them, your name be lifted up. Thank you for the faithful witness of these dear persecuted sisters and brothers in the Lord. We pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks, Brother Cheong Wai Chun, for the message. If you are new, have a prayer request or a testimony you would like to share, we would love to hear from you. So please visit the website on the link in the description below. Now let us close this Sunday service with a prayer. Fine Heaven, we want to thank you for this time. We want to thank you that we could worship you, that we could listen to you, O Lord, and we could have a message from you, Father. Lord, we want to pray that you will continue to be there with us throughout the week continue to protect us from the virus and continue to guide us. We want to pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen.